so, I'm Dave McMurtry. Um, I'm here to talk about the history of Palm Park, the early history of Palm Park. So if you're just here for the computer, you're going to be disappointed, but that's okay. Um, so why talk about the history of Commodore? So for me, like, did anyone here have a Commodore 64 growing up or still have one? Couple people. So I still have one. Um, I got one, I was a kid, and I didn't think a whole lot about it because I was a kid, I just had a computer. And I stopped using it, I think, I know, like, I didn't have a natural progression from PC. I did Commodore 64, then I started working at a university. And I was working night shift as a computer operator. And what you do as a computer operator, it's really boring. You mount tapes, and you wait for jobs to die. And you just sit there, so there's a lot of dead time. So while I was doing that, I started doing research, because I was really interested in Commodore as a kid, and I thought, what ever happened to them? And I didn't know. So I looked, and I was like, holy cow, they're gone. Like, how could that be? How could this huge company be gone? And so I started looking into like, how they disappeared, like, how they failed, and I started doing library research. research. Well, the more I looked into it, the more I started wanting to learn more about the company. And I started looking into how they were founded and stuff. So I started that in 95, and it's 2023, and I'm still doing it. So, here to talk about that. Now, now the source is, like, where do you get Congress information? Newspapers, they're good because they ran the whole length from when Congress was in bit, like when they were founded, until they were gone. Good. But the problem is general information in them. Um, it's, it's stuff that's generally newsworthy. So, you know, Commodore coming out with a new computer, maybe they didn't care, or a new calculator. That's not going to make the news. But the big things, you know, like um, <laughs> criminal indictments and things, that's in the news. So that was in there. Um, magazines, awesome source of information. Uh, those are like, it, it's, it's more, um, that more, uh, what, what, what word am I looking for? Targeted. More targeted, you know. So if you're into computers, you get a computer magazine or a Commodore did their own magazine. So you know, really good information about Commodore and those. That was awesome. Uh, websites. Wikipedia gets made fun of a lot, and it should. It's not that great, but <laughs> it does give you a starting point, so you can jump off. So you'll find information on there, and you'll say, "Well, that might be wrong." But then you go digging in, and you look, and you can find more information. So, and the other thing, the Commodore International Wikipedia page now it's actually way better than it used to be. Um, in 2018, it was almost fiction at that point. There was nothing on it that was accurate. I don't know who did it, because I tried to. It's really difficult to update. Um, whoever updated it, the early history on, on Wikipedia for Commodore National, it's actually pretty accurate now. It's not bad. Uh, Zimmers.net, everything you want to know about Commodore is on there. And Bo is right back there, so that's the guy who runs it. Um, but no, it's a huge resource, and that's been around forever, too. Um, modern day interviews with people who worked at Commodore. So I actually do try to talk to people who worked at Commodore. Um, Andy Finkel has been uh, so kind and answers about a million questions. And Andy, if I get anything wrong here, maybe tell me, don't, don't, don't say it all loud, just tell me how to do it. Uh, but no, I've done a bunch of interviews. Um, I did an interview with Gail Wellington and wrote a really nice bio of Gail, and it's on my website if you want to look at it. But, um, I, I've managed to reach out to a ton of people who used to work there and talk to them a lot and ask a bunch of questions. Now, the good thing about interviews is it's the people who actually lived it. Like, you're not going to get better than that. The bad thing is people see, people see things through different lenses. So, like, even at work, like, if you go to work tomorrow and say, hey, why was that project successful? You ask five people, you'll get five different answers. You know, oh, it was that guy that did everything. And somebody else will say, no, that guy stopped. It was this guy who did everything. So, people see things through different lenses. The other thing is, so this stuff happened 40 years ago. So, I mean, people forget stuff, too. Um, I asked Andy a lot. I was asking Andy a ton of really technical questions, like, how did you build software, and how did this work, and how did that work? And, I mean, you're asking somebody 40 years ago what they did at their job, how it worked. It's not easy to try to those things up sometimes. Uh, the next one, these are the gold standard, like, for documents. Legal documents, government filings, so there were lawsuits filed against the public work. Um, attorneys are very pedantic. When you get a legal document, everything on it is right. So for dating things, that's the best you can do. Um, I have purchased just about every incorporation document I can find about Commodore. So we know when companies were spun up and when they closed and things like that. We've got all that. Um, I've given money to the Bahamian government three times now and still haven't gotten anything from them. Other than they said that Commodore didn't exist as a corporation. Um, SEC filings, the IRS tax investigation. When the IRS did an investigation of Commodore in, in what was it, the 80s, I can't remember, it said, well, you owe us $100 million, whatever it was. 
Um, the investigation from that is actually fascinating because it's not just financial stuff. They go into a lot of the history of the company there, and I found some things in that document that I've really never seen anywhere else. So stuff like that's good. Uh, annual reports to shareholders, I've gotten every annual report. They're good, but you have to remember what they are. They're marketing. It's, you know, invest in our company, give us money. So they can't outright lie in them. You know, there, there are legal consequences for doing that, but they're, they're, they're good information still. The last one up there, the report on the collapse of Atlantic Acceptance. Um, Atlantic Acceptance was funding Congress early growth in the 60s. It was a Canadian finance company, and they tanked spectacularly in 1965. At the time, it was the largest financial collapse in Canadian history. So there was a huge government investigation. Now, as Commodore fans, we're really lucky that happened, because otherwise, we, nobody would know any of that early stuff. But we're lucky we have all these depositions and stuff that happen as part of that. So a lot of the stuff we know about the really early history comes from that. Uh, books, Brian Bagnell has written a couple books. They're phenomenal. If you haven't read them, they're great. They're very well researched. Um, David Pleasance did a book not too long ago. Michael Tomchak wrote a book, Home Computer Wars, not too long after it happened, so pretty fresh memories. Um, the last one, internal documents. And this is how, like, this, this specifically is why I'm standing here talking. So uh, about 2017, I think, I got this idea like, man, people who used to work at Congress, some of them might still have like documents from when they worked there, engineering documents, sales reports, stuff like that. Wouldn't it be cool if we could find those people and save all that documentation and learn from it, you know? So it, it's a pretty tall ask to just reach out to people randomly on the, on the internet and say, hey, you don't know me, but do you have any papers from where you worked 40 years ago? Um, but what occurred to me is like most of those people are on Facebook. You know, they're old like me. Uh, they're not kids. Kids aren't on Facebook, but old people like us are on Facebook. So I created a Facebook group and started inviting people from Commodore and said exactly that. like. Here's what I'm trying to do. If you have any old documentation, or if you have stories to tell, or memories to share, or pictures, or anything. So I put together the, the Facebook group, and what came of that was really awesome. It was um, Don Greenbaum, the former treasurer, sent me a box, um, UPS, I think it weighed like 17 pounds. So I, he sent me 17 pounds of documents, and it was all like internal sales reports and stuff. Um, so just stuff that you'd never get anywhere else. So we saved all that. Um, Andy has been scanning stuff like crazy, and the, the deal we have is Andy scans it, and then I clean it up, turns the PDFs, and upload them to archive.org. Sorry, I talk too fast anyway, so taking a break is probably good. Um, so if you're ever bored, and you really want to see a bunch of old Commodore documentation, it's all on archive.org. Um, Commodore on International is what I upload stuff as. But it's all there. All the stuff Andy sent to me, all the stuff Don Greenbaum sent me, um, Michael Tomchak sent me a bunch of documentation. There's a lot of great stuff. What I've learned from doing all this research is you have to validate information across as many sources as you can. Because you'll find stuff written in one place and something completely opposite in another place. So anything that I want to do, before I'm confident in saying something, I really want to make sure I've seen it like a bunch of places. And the other thing is, everything I think I know of history of Commodore, it's subject to change as I learn more stuff. As I get more documentation, I learn new stuff, and I think, oh, I thought that before, I was wrong. So, with all that out of the way, jumping right in, before call, oh boy, that does not render well, does it? It's a long projector. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, that was a nice photo, too. It was really good on the screen here. Before Commodore, so and everybody here probably knows who Jack Trammell was. He was one of the co-founders of Commodore. Um, he was born Edek Stromil in Poland in 1928, separated from his parents in 1939, spent the war years World War II in a couple different concentration camps. He came to the United States in 1947. Now, I said all that really confidently, right? So it must all be accurate. I've researched this, and I know all of that to be true. And I'll get into this one. I'm not going to get into everything as much, otherwise we wouldn't accomplish anything in an hour. But just that, man, that really doesn't turn the very well does it? So just as an example, though, this is where you can get some of that information. So this is actually when Jack Trammell immigrated to the United States in 1947. There he is, under his birth name, under his original birth name on line 11 there. And you say, well, wow, that's awesome. You know, that's a government document. That's got to all be accurate, right? Mm -hmm. So if you start digging in, the very first thing, which ship did he come over on? The SS Marine Flasher. How could that possibly be wrong? That's got to be accurate. Except, when Jack himself was interviewed in 1990, he was asked, what boat did you come over on? Jack Pennell said, he came over on the Marine Swallow. 
So the paperwork says Marie Flasher. So you could say, well, maybe he just had a bad memory. It was 43 years later. But there actually was a Marie Swallow operating at that time. So maybe his memory's bad. Maybe the documentation's wrong. I don't know. Next thing, you look at age. I mean, birthday is a pretty easy thing, right? How could you possibly get that wrong? You know when you're born, it says he was 19. Well, let's talk about Jack and Rose's birthday. This was when the Securities and Exchange Commission were, in, were um, investigating him in 1966. They couldn't figure out when he was born. So he told them when they met, he was born December 13, 1928. On his Army induction form, it says September 13, 1927. Um, there's another one, his visa, December 13th, 1927. And he told Dunn and Bradstreet he was born in 1929. So we don't really know when Jack Trumbo was born. Um, apparently it actually was December 13th, 1928, which makes that form, again, incorrect because he would have been 18 and not 19. Moving along, marital status, it says he was single, and guess what? This was, uh, what, November 10th, 1947. That is his wedding um, with that out of the way, we move on. Manfred Kapp was the other half of Cromwell. He was the other person who co-founded it. And I'm not going to go into that much depth of how we know this is right or not right. Um, from now on, you can assume that everything I tell you might be right. It's the best I can get, but you can see what day it is. You really don't know. Um, he was born in 28, came to the United States in 47, same here as Jack Cromwell. Um, the first company that was created, so this is where it starts to get interesting, because the, every major publication that has ever talked about the founding of Congress has gone wildly wrong. Um, the very first company that was ever created was called Marvel Trading Company. So Jack was in the Army from 48 through 50. When he, that first tour in the Army, he was a cook. When he got out of the Army in 1950, he founded Marvel Trading Company in New York. Now, I don't know what that company did. I don't have the slightest idea. I haven't gotten any documentation about that yet and I didn't order the incorporation stuff. One moment. Um, key to note, Manfred Kapp was not involved in Marvel. They hadn't met yet, they didn't co-found this, it was just Jack Trammell. But what happened to Jack was, he got called back to active duty in August of 1951. Incidentally, his second tour in the Army is where he learned typewriter repair. So his first tour, he was a cook. The second tour, he did typewriter repair. That's where he picked up the trade. So he got called back to the Army. Marvel was only in business for about a year. He closed it up in 1951, went back to the Army. When he got back from the Army, he was doing typewriter repair. So, oh man, you really can't read that. Sorry. That is actually an ace typewriter repair company, which you can almost see all pixelized there. But when he got back from the Army, he started working at a company in New York called Ace Typewriter Repair. Um, that's where he met Manfred Kapp. They were working there together. Uh, he, he came back and was working there at 51. Manfred Kapp didn't come back from the Army until 52 or 53. He couldn't remember which year. That's where they met. They were working there together. They were repairing typewriters. And that is how they got started. In 54, they were still working there together, and they decided to go into business together. Um, they purchased 200 typewriters. Uh, you hear, you read about that one a lot. They got the 200 typewriters from a contract, a contact he knew from the Army for the United Nations. Uh, Jack Trammell and Manfred Kapp were working out of his garage to repair and resell them, and then they purchased Singer Typewriter Company in 1954. Singer is probably, this is absolutely the most incorrectly documented part of Congress early history you will ever find. Um, what you often read is Congress was founded as a typewriter repair company in the Bronx. It wasn't. It was Singer Typewriter Company that was in the Bronx. It was on 562 East Fordham Road. That is right on the edge of the campus of Fordham College, which I think is now Fordham University. Um, and also, they didn't found that company. The company already existed. I think that's actually from 1950, I don't remember. But they purchased it. The company was there, and they bought it, and they started running it. While they were running that, Manfred Kapp was doing the administrative work, the bookkeeping, things like that, and he was doing internal repairs. Jack Trammell was out on the road. He was doing sales, and he was doing outside repairs. He'd go into people's companies and fix their typewriters. Um, this is actually a very important thing because this is this is along the path to Commodore. So this is one of the one of the products that Singer sold was the Everest adding machine. And Singer was the exclusive distributor for Everest adding machines in the Bronx. So Jack Trammell, he went on a, on a vacation with his wife to Toronto, and he did what every guy does when they go to visit their in-laws. He found something to do other than visit his in-laws. He went and made it a business trip. So he started visiting all the local office machine companies and said, hey, are you interested in these Everest adding machines? We're the ex exclusive distributor. Do you want to sell them? Uh, and interest was great. 
So what happened was Jack Tremont got back to New York and negotiated a deal with the manufacturer of Everest to become the exclusive distributor of Everest adding machines for all of Canada. So now you can see the direction where this is going. We're still before Commodore. Man, I wish these pictures looked better. Uh, we're still before Commodore. What you have on the left there is the incorporation documents for Everest Office Machine Company. That was September of 1955. So Singer was still going. Jack Tremell moved to Toronto, founded Everest Office mach Machine. Manfred Tapp stayed behind and kept Singer going. All good. What you see there is actually two Toronto stores. That's where Everest stored in Toronto. It's a UPS store now. Uh, but, and since I, oh man, since I was on uh, maps.google.com, that is the apartment complex where Jack Tremell lived. Um, I think it's called Wing Green Court. And there is something important on this, though, that gets really funny a little bit, though. It's in Don Mills, Ontario. Um, but what happened was they sold Singer Typewriter Company. It got difficult to run two companies. So Manny Cap, they sold Singer in 56, and Manfred Cap and his wife moved. They lived in the same exact apartment complex. So the Cap and the Trammells lived in Wintering Court in Don Mills, Ontario. And again, remember Don Mills, because that gets really funny later. So the birth of Comfort, how did that come about? This guy right there that nobody's ever heard of, his name is Eric Marcus. He was the Everest distributor for the United Kingdom. So that's how Jack Trammell knew Eric Marcus. Everest distributor, Everest distributor. And that quote I took, I'm not going to read the whole thing, I'm not going to be you here, but Jack Trammell thought very highly of that guy. So it wasn't just a chance meeting, it wasn't a brief encounter. The guy had a big impact on him and really guided Jack Trammell in his early career and his early business dealings. So it was Eric Marcus who told Jack Trammell, hey, there's this Czechoslovakian company who's making typewriters. They're looking for a Canadian distributor. Are you interested? That's why they founded Commodore. That's how it came about. Um, those are the actual corporation documents from Commodore from 1958. I bought those from the Canadian government. They came on Microfish, um, and they showed up on a Saturday. And I had to wait until Monday to go down to work and actually read them. I was dying because I couldn't wait to see them. But um, we know when Congo was founded, October 10, 1958. We know the exact date. That's it. That's the receipt from five, the filing fees. It cost, it cost 100 bucks to found Congo back then. Um, but that's what they did. They founded this company and they were going to sell typewriters. So what were they selling? Console branded typewriters manufactured in Czechoslovakia. And I'm not even going to attempt. Is anybody in here speak Czechoslovakian and pronounce that? I can't. I'm not even going to try. Uh, but that's the company who made them. That's not who Commodore bought them from. Commodore was buying them through a company named Kovo. And I should have mentioned on the last slide, they, they were incorporated initially as Commodore Portable Typewriter Company Limited in Toronto. It started out as a Canadian company. They just did typewriters when they were first founded. And there's a picture of one of the early typewriters. That's one of the earliest models. That's their first logo they ever used. It's just that big sweeping C with the honor next to it. Um, I just thought it was a nice picture. But that's what the early typewriters looked like. Um, here's where Commodore started getting in trouble. So the good news is Jack Tremell was a heck of a salesman, and they got into major department stores in Canada really early, so that's great. And they started getting huge volume orders for their typewriters. And you'd think, you own a company, that's the best thing you want, right? Well, there's a problem, though. They were a brand new company, and they weren't credit worthy. So the key company orders 500 typewriters, and Commodore goes to the to Kobo and check his pocket and says, give us 500 typewriters on credit. They, they were credit worthy. Nobody was going to sell them 500 typewriters and hope for the best. So what they started doing was a thing called factoring. Uh, and this this really goes in. This this is how Commodore started on a very slippery slope. Um, factoring is basically, if, if you don't know what it is, it's like a payday loan for companies. So if you have sold, say, and say um, Commodore sold like $10,000 worth of typewriters to TE company. So now TE company owes them 10 grand. Well, what they would do is there was this factoring company that Jack was using called Interprovincial Discount. They would pay 85% of face value for receivables. So if if uh, Eaton's owed Concord 10 grand, what, what Interprovincial Discount would do is say, here's $8,500, that's yours. Now I'll wait for the 10, 10, 10 grand to come in. So they'd get $10,000 in 30 days. Commodore would get 85% of it up front. So Commodore didn't have to wait for their money, but they got they took a 15% hit on it. So you figure if they're selling typewriters and maybe he can have 20% profit, they're giving away 15% right off the top. So that's something Jack Trammell wanted to fix. So he met with a guy named Doug Annett of Annett and Company. I put an ad up there. And Douglas Annett told him to pump sand. He said, I'm not interested in helping you. But what he did was that's who introduced Jack, Tr Jack Trammell to a guy named Campbell Powell Morgan, who you probably hear of C.P. Morgan. Um, that's, that's his full name, Campbell Powell. 
So Cullen responded in 58, early 59, he got introduced to C.P. Morgan. Uh, and this gets to be fascinating stuff. That's a picture of C.P. Morgan there. He was the president of an Atlantic Acceptance Corporation. I mentioned that pretty early along. Um, it was another finance company, and they also weren't interested in directly helping Commodore, because again, they're a new company. Nobody wanted to take that risk. But the awesome thing about this was C.P. Morgan wanted to put Atlantic into the factory business. So they were mostly, I think, auto, auto financing and uh, commercial real estate. I think that's the business they were in. And he wanted to steer them into factory. So how Jack Trimble negotiated this, I don't know, but it's a brilliant, I mean, he was obviously brilliantly good at what he did. Um, not only did he end up, they, they formed a new company called Commodore Sales Acceptance, and that was a factoring company. Um, not only did Jack Trimble have any source of financing, Commodore ended up owning 25% of the company. And it, it gets one step better even, the 25%, the money they got for that, they borrowed $25,000 from Commodore Sales Acceptance to purchase 25% of the company. So in a stroke of brilliance, he now had his own factoring company to finance his own company. Uh, and they were also, they had the finance of Atlantic, Atlantic Acceptance behind them. So now that they had that, up to this point, they were still calling a portable typewriter company. They were still a Canadian company. They were mostly doing business in Canada. But they did start to expand the United States fairly early. The way that happened, if you've ever seen these early Macy's advertisements, they have Commodore um, adding machines, Commodore typewriters and stuff in them. Uh, if you've ever seen those, there's a reason. There was a company, there were two companies in the United States called Hell Square Business Machines and Superior Typewriter Company. And I don't have my glasses on, so I can't read my notes. So all this has to come from my head. So uh, pardon me about to think a little bit. Um, the, the ad on the right is Superior Typewriter Company, and the ad on the left is a Macy's one. They were owned by the Purvin family. A guy named William Purvin started, I don't know exactly when, uh, but I, I found ads that released as early as 1932. So they were pretty well established companies. By, the, by this time, by the, by the 1960s era, era um, his son George Purvin was running it, and there was a guy named Herbert Purvin, who was his brother. They ran it together. Um, Commodore was already doing business with them. They were selling products, they were taking all their money, so they decided it would be nice if we just could purchase those. Um, so what they did was they made a deal with George Bourbon. They, they loaned him 25 grand. He used that 25 grand to buy his brother Herbert Elk, and they formed two new companies. So the original were Superior Typewriter and Herald Square. They formed a company named Herald Superior Office Equipment, and they formed Commodore Business Machines, Inc. That was the same Commodore Business, well, it actually wasn't, but I'm not going to bore you that detail. That is the Commodore Business Machines, Inc. United States entity that survived until 94. That's the one they founded in 1960. And Calmer bought that, and they started selling in the United States and through those companies. Um, oh, man. Sorry, I got to have myself by a slide there. But anyway, that's the actual incorporation documents for the 1960s Calmer company. Uh, but you can't read it anyway, so I jumped ahead of something here. Sorry. Um, those are actual pictures of... 1962, one of Commodore's least retail locations. So that would have been inside of a Macy's store. Um, I thought it was a cool picture, so I wanted to share that. So Commodore kept operating those least retail locations. So Commodore was in the retail business back then, in the early 60s. They had their own, their own Commodore staff selling out these least retail uh, locations. Now, the partnership with George Perman, what George Perman got out of this deal was he was 50% owner of both of those companies. He was 50% owner of Commodore Business Machines, Inc., and 50% owner of Herald Superior Office Equipment. Um, but it only lasted about a year. He did not get along very well with Jack Trammell. Um, he, he, he claimed in depositions that he saw Jack Trammell using whiteout on inventory reports to change the value of existing inventory. Uh, and he didn't like that. So he withdrew from the company in October of 61. So, the, the first deal only lasted about a year. Commodore kept on trucking. I just thought that was a funny quote. It was, the quote itself was, was relayed by George Perman. Uh, after he left doing business with Jack Trammell at Commodore, he wanted to become a school teacher and never went into business again. But a quote directly from George Perman, he said, Jack, well, George, you are no businessman. You sell typewriters and I'll sell stock. So it gives you a, a, a little glimpse into what Jack Trammell was all about. He was a businessman. He would have sold anything. He didn't care if it was typewriters. He was in business. And he was good at it. Uh, so now they're selling these Canadian typewriters in the United States. And um, I mentioned, I even put Canadian in the title there because Commodore was a Canadian company and they were selling typewriters in Canada. Now they're selling in the United States. But they were doing something interesting. That's one of the typewriters. And notice it says really big, molded right into the case, made in Canada. Um, but I, I mentioned uh, just a few slides ago, they were actually made in Czechoslovakia. So that's interesting, right? 
And well, there's in the back, made in Canada. They were really proud of that being made in Canada. What Commodore did, and it was a stroke of brilliance, uh, it was not illegal, but it was probably close to it. Uh, they hired a design company named Macintosh Associates to create cases for typewriters. And Macintosh made these really nice looking cases. Well, Commodore was buying the guts of the typewriters from Czechoslovakia and putting them in these cases made in Canada and importing them to the United States as made in Canada. And they were able to do that despite the fact that Commodore, or the United States at the time had import restrictions. You could not import things from communist countries back then. So you could not import Czechoslovakian typewriters to the United States. Well, Commodore wasn't. They were Canadian typewriters. That was something that was <laughs> um, And that did not go over well. It, it especially didn't go over well with Smith Corona's vice president, the guy named Edwin Graff. Now, Smith Corona had been around for a zillion years. They were a wildly successful typewriter company. And Commodore was this tiny little wee, you know, two guys running it, this tiny little wee building. Why did Smith Corona care about this? Uh, if you can actually see the numbers down here, uh, they, I think it'd be awesome if you see this, because what that is, is that guy, Edwin Graff, testified at the U.S. House Ways and Needs Committee uh, during the 1962 trade expansion here. They wanted the United States government to start slapping a 30% import tariff on Canadian typewriters because it was putting Smith Corona, it was jeopardizing their business, they couldn't compete. Um, what you get down here at the very bottom, though, um, and that's actually from the Ways and Means Committee, so you can see that I really dig up a lot of esoteric documentation. But it tells you that they were importing about 7,000 typewriters a year. So for a brand new company, a tiny company, they were doing huge volumes of business already in 1962. Next is when we get into the adding machine market. Uh, this was kind of just a one-off. I hate to even put it in here because there's not a lot to say about it. But that is the first adding machine I'm aware of that Commodore ever sold. It's a fully mechanical adding machine. No electronics, obviously, in 1960. Um, but their later ones, they called them electromechanical. So it was an electric motor that police moved the mechanisms. This was nothing. It was fully mechanical. Uh, they were sold in Eaton's department stores. I only know that because I found them in a couple of Eaton's ads. I've never seen them anywhere else. And I've only ever seen them in 1960. They were manufactured by a company named Nisa in Czechoslovakia. I make the assumption that because they already had the Czechoslovakian connection for the typers, that's all it came about. I really don't know that. I'm just making that part up. Um, but they eventually did move into the added machine market. Either late 60 or early 61. And there's a name you already saw once with the founding of Commodore, Eric Marcus. If it was not for him, Commodore wouldn't have existed. If it was not for him, they wouldn't have gotten at the adding machine business either. Um, Eric Marcus met Manfred Kapp in Paris in either 60 or 61, they weren't sure, uh, in an equipment ex exhibition and said, check out these cool new adding machines, would you like to sell those? And in fact, they thought it was a great idea. So Jack Trammell negotiated the North American rights to sell those machines which were manufactured by, I'm not going to pronounce that either, Willie Filer Adding Machine Company, we'll just call it. Um, interestingly, Eric Marcus was the former son-in-law of Willie Filer, who founded Willie Filer. Uh, so that was how that connection was made. Uh, but that's what they did. They started selling those quick adding machines. And then, you're welcome to come there. Yeah. Over there. Oh, thank you. Um, so they started selling adding machines, and you can see, well, if you could actually read that, you could see that um, they already, this is pretty, this is 1962, uh, they already had a whole line of these adding machines by 1962, that's an electromechanical one, and they were selling a lot of them, they were selling so many of them, that um, so Jack Trammell actually went to Germany and met with Will, um, Willie Filer and said, hey, you need to increase production, they're not keeping up for demand, and they couldn't, so Commodore bought Willie Filer the manufacturing plan. It was when they really got into manufacturing. Before that, they always called themselves a marketing company. Um, that was when they started manufacturing and bought Willie Filer with $1.2 million. A ton of money back then. They had that kind of money because they were being backed by the Accepting Corporation, which was a huge company. Um, 1962, things really started taking off for Commodore. Two things happened. One, they went public. They got converted to a public corporation. And two, they changed their name from Commodore Portable Typewriter Company to Commodore Business Machines Canada Limited. They weren't Commodore International until 1976. Um, so in 1962, they became Commodore Business Machines Canada Limited. And you can see that's their actual public offering there. So that was the big deal for 62. Other big deal for 1962, they entered a new product line. They started selling copying machines. So uh, they were, you know, they called themselves Commodore Business Machines. They were certainly not a typewriter company anymore by this point. They were trying to diversify as much as they could. 
Uh, the coffee machines, they were Eichner, made out of Frankfurt, Germany. Um, what Comber liked about these was they required a special transfer sheet, so they saw that as a recurring source of revenue. We'll sell the coffee machine, and we can sell these transfer sheets, and we'll just keep getting this revenue. So they hired, this was also Comber's first big advertising campaign. Um, they did, I remember, maybe 10 different ads. It's a lot of them. It wasn't just that one. That's one example. They hired a company called the Conti Advertising Agency out of New York. They did a whole big advertising campaign, and they started selling these dry coffee copying machines. Um, another cool thing, this is, um, that is a picture of 200 Frank Road in Hicksville, New York. Um, and that is actual Commodore employees assembling Commodore dry coffee machines. Now, what Commodore did here was they bought a company named Analog Controls Inc., who was at 200 Frank Road, and they started manufacturing them domestically. So that's actually people working for Commodore in 19, early 1960s making dry coffee machines. And that is what 200 Frank Road looks like today, Hicksville, New York, if you're in the area, stop by. Um, new product line for 1964, steel office furniture. So everybody has seen the filing cabinet and said, oh, cool, I know the car made filing cabinets. And they did. They made filing cabinets. They made desks. They made all kinds of cool stuff out of steel. Um, like almost everything else Commodore ever did, they didn't start making it. They started by buying it from somebody else, slapping a badge on it, and reselling it. Um, with, the, with the office equipment, they thought they'd be able to have better margins if they did manufacture it themselves. And they also had money. Uh, they had a lot of money because of the plan of acceptance. So they built this big 30,000 square foot addition behind their headquarters, which by this point was at 946 Warden Avenue in Scarborough, Ontario. And then they bought a metal stamping company named Bell Pre Company Limited. And they moved them into their facility and started making office furniture. So they made, that's actually, that's Commerce headquarters. The picture's from 1973, but it looked about, the building still looks pretty much like that. Um, that is them at that building, the plant behind it, making the office furniture, and that's a finished desk. Um, it's a nice, awesome Commodore boss back there that would probably sell for like a jillion dollars on eBay today. <laughs> um, 1965, so everything up until now has been Commodore. You know, they were founded, they started growing, and they really were taking off. And they were, you know, you got to be, if you're Jack Hermel at this point, you got to be happy, right? 1965 was when the wheels started coming off. It was absolute mayhem. Um, the list of companies up here, so I, I mentioned a couple companies, Analog Controls and a couple other companies that Commodore bought. And they were legitimate companies. They were doing real business. Um, during the time that they were involved with Atlantic, this tiny list is it, really a tiny list. They got involved in Five Wheels Limited, it was an auto leasing firm. And, and the, the, the convoluted logic there was, well, you know, we could lease other stuff, so we'll buy an auto leasing firm. Um, Jack Trinnell was the president of a bank for a while. So uh, J-Man Distributors was an actual company that was in New York. They sold office equipment. Baronet Associates, as far as I can tell, never actually did any business. They were just a shell company. Um, ACE Business Machines, I have no idea if they ever did anything. I've actually purchased all the incorporation documents. I know they exist, uh, but I don't think those companies ever did anything. Commodore Sales Acceptance and Commodore Factors, they were the two factoring companies. So Sales Acceptance was the one in Canada. Commodore Factors, they incorporated in the United States. So they were doing factoring in the United States. They had two different finance companies. So all notes I put on here, and the extra question marks are there for a reason, because this has got to be the best thing you'll ever read about if you ever start reading about Congress early history. Um, the depositions when people were being interviewed, like what is Don Mills? Don Mills showed up as only Congress stock. Don Mills showed up on all kinds of stuff, and nobody in the depositions could tell them what Don Mills was. And remember I said they lived in Don Mills, Ontario. Um, there was, at one point, they said Don Mills was a person. Nobody knew who it was, but he was a person. Then they said, no, 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 it was a company. It was incorporated in Georgia. It may be true. I looked. I've never been able to find it as an incorporated company anywhere. Um, then at one point, Jack Trinnell told the investigators, no, it was just a code word we use to represent a group of companies, because it seems to just say Don Mills and list all the companies. So if you ever are, are insane like me and start looking at this old documentation, you're going to see Don Mills pop up all over the place, and nobody knew what it was. Uh, Wilson Stationers, I listed last there on purpose uh, because right around 1960, again, I don't know my notes, I think it was 64 or 65, Palmer negotiated to buy Wilson Stationers, and they were the largest stationary company in Canada at the time. It was a big deal, a huge purchase. Um, but there's a little timeline of how things went disastrously wrong for Commodore there. Um, April 7, 65, they put down a $100,000 deposit to purchase Wilson Stationers for $3 million. Bucks. That's a lot of money. But they had $3 million bucks because they had Atlantic Acceptance Corporation. Except 
On June 16th of 1965, Atlantic, Atlantic acceptance collapsed. They defaulted on their entire debt of over 100 million bucks, which back then, 100 million bucks, that was a lot of money. That's like battleship money back then. Um, so Congress had a big problem. They legally consummated the deal to buy Wilson on June 23rd, and they no longer had 3 million bucks. So what they had to do was they borrowed 3 million bucks from another company that I'm blanking on right now, but it was only a six month term, and they had to put up their Willie Filer adding machine company as collateral for this $3 million loan. So they basically had six months to come up with $3 million bucks or they were going to lose their manufacturing company and lose, three, and lose their $100,000 deposit. Now, what they started doing is they started borrowing money from two Irving Gould run companies, Amber Holdings and Jason Holdings. Irving Gould was already extremely wealthy by this point. He, he was wealthy way before Commodore. He started loaning Commodore money to survive, and then he started doing something else to help Commodore survive. He had, a lot, he had a lot of contacts in the business world. So he started brokering the sale of Commodore assets. Anything they could sell, he sold. One of the things he sold was Willie Filer. They had to sell it. Um, and by brokering the sale, that means Irving Gould took a percentage of the sale for doing nothing other than selling the company, and Commodore got the money. Uh, but at the end of this, Commodore was left owing Irving Gould way more money than they could ever pay him. That's how Irving Gould became associated with Commodore. That's how he became the chairman of the board in 1966. He took an ownership percentage. I think it was something like he got 18% ownership of the company back then. And he got the chairman of the board title in 1966. So that's how Irving Gould became involved. Um, but they had a problem at this point. They no longer had an adding machine factory. They had, they had customers that wanted to buy them, but they didn't have a way to make them. So what happened in 1966, their vice president of manufacturing was a guy named Thomas McCourty. Um, and there's a, I, I did a whole bio about him because he's a really cool guy. So if you go to my website, there's a whole bio about Thomas McCourty. Um, he negotiated a, an OEM deal with Rico out of Japan. So this Commodore got back to OEM deals. They weren't doing manufacturing of them. They were just paying Rico and slapping their badge on them. Thomas McGordy actually designed the case of the one on the right there. That's a Commodore 202 adding machine. You see those things everywhere. Uh, that was supposed to be a Commodore-specific thing. Nobody else was supposed to buy it. I've actually seen one with Rico branding, though, so I don't know how that worked. The one on the left, the Commodore 201, that was sold as a Rico 201. That was not Commodore-specific. And just as a cool little tiny piece of trivia, um, I was I, I interviewed Thomas McCordy's kids, uh, two of his kids. They're older now. They're like old like me. Um, but they told me a ton of cool stuff about him. And one of the things they told me was his design inspiration for that Palmer 202 adding machine case was the taillights of a Ford Mustang. He said he was driving home from Palmer's offices in New York back to Norfolk where he lived, and he was following a Ford Mustang the whole way home, and he liked how the taillights looked. So that is what inspired the design of that adding machine, in case you were ever curious. And finally, this is where we get to electronics. 1967 is where Commodore started selling their very, very first electronic calculators. So the one on the left there is the Commodore 500E. The one on the right is the AL1000. AL um, they were actual pro. They were electronic for the first time. They weren't electromechanical. They had Nixie tube displays. If you've ever seen a Nixie tube display, they are absolutely the coolest display you'll ever see. Um, if you wanted to buy one of those now, they cost about a zillion dollars. I think there's one on eBay, literally for like 1,500 bucks. And I like Nixie tube displays, but not that much. Um, the reason I put both of them up here is because this is another one of those contentious things. I found a lot of documentation that says the AL1000 was Commerce's first electronic calculator. Uh, Leonard Trammell, who is Jack Trammell's son, who probably knows better, is quite certain that it was the 500E. Now, they came out around the same time, but Leonard was very certain that the 500E was the very first electronic calculator Commodore ever did. And that is what launched them into the calculator business. It was Casio who made them, they rebranded them. And that is where I am, because that's where they get into electronics, and that's, that's modern stuff. So, any questions about all the uh, rubbish I just talked talk about? Both. Oh. So I'm wondering if if you ever got any sense of the price difference between like comparable Smith Smith Corona models and the Commodore ones. I'm wondering how bad he was hurting them. I'm quite curious about that too. We'll look. I'll take it up. Yes, Chris. So later, is it true that the furniture equipment turned into those pet cases? Yeah. So it, absolutely, but I don't think it was made at that building. So that building at 9464 and Avenue, they were making the furniture. Commodore bought two more steel companies. They bought Gilton Enterprises and Nortex Products. They were both in anywhere that it was Nortex. California, I think. 
Um, I'm pretty sure those are the companies that were making the pet cases in 77. So Palmer was making the pet cases, and but it was not the original metal company. It was Nortex Products, I think, where they were making them. How big was uh, Palmer's uh, market share of the egg machine market at its peak? I have no idea. I'm sorry. Point yes. zero 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 one percent. Yeah, I think you got it. The thing, Palmer was a small company back then. Um, I, I put together a, um, a little chart of their their revenue over the years, and I mean, if you look at it, it's 1958, 19, you know, the whole way, and then 1982, it goes like that. I mean, they were a tiny company for most of their existence. Even in the 70s, when they were selling calculators, they were in major retail stores, but they were still doing like you know, five million a year in sales. You know, so they were still, which again, five million, that's great, but it, it's not, you know, Microsoft money. Um, so you said that the uh, financial firm collapsed in 1965 and that they were on board. So how did they come to know about Irving Gould's companies that brought money from them? I don't know how that connection was made. So it just it happened and then that's how Irving Gould got involved. Yeah, Irving Gould started selling off companies for them and loaning them money. So I mean, um, I'm guessing that, you know, somebody, somebody or somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you look how the, the, the path went from Douglas Annett to C. Powell Morgan, like all those guys ended up being friends. They all ended up being in business together. Um, Annett and company took a 24% ownership stake of Congress sales acceptance. So they were like, well, we don't, want to, we don't want to loan money to you, but they were perfectly willing to go into business with them. So when Congress sales acceptance was founded, Congress got a 25% stake, Annett got 24, and Atlantic got 51. So all those people were friends with each other and did business together. Wow, okay, thanks. Yes. What year did they change to Commodore International? So Commodore International was founded in 1967. Uh, it was founded in the Bahamas, which is no surprise because our people lived in the Bahamas. Well, he wanted to be in the Bahamas because he was there. When they founded it in 67, they just called it the marketing arm. So that's all it did in 1967. In 1976 is when they did the reorg, and Commodore International became the parent. Um, there was a company underneath that called Commodore Electronics Limited, and then all the sales subsidiaries were under that. So. Commodore International, Commodore Electronics, and then Commodore Business Machines, and Commodore Business Machines UK, and such like that. So that all happened in 1976. If you had stock in Commodore Business Machines Canada, you got, well, for every one share of stock you had in Commodore Business Machines Canada, you got one share of Commodore International when they, when they changed it. Did you speak with Jack Sun, you said? Um, yes, sorry, that's it. Yeah, I've talked to, so I've only talked to Leonard online, I've never met him in person. Um, and Leonard has been nice to me. I, I try not to bother him. I get the impression he would rather not be bothered by me, so I, I try to limit those. Um, I've talked to poor Andy there 8,000 times, um, 22,000 times, I don't know. Andy, when, when, when I, I just have to imagine you're sitting there and you see my name pop up and just cringe on this guy again. Yeah, I've never met him in person. He's been very nice to me, but I try to Anything else? All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Andy, thank you.